um, a sort of a, a ghastly case from the Met's history. Um, and I want to talk about that briefly and what we're doing to fix the issues that it highlights. Uh, obviously, you're all aware that from sort of day one, high standards has been top of my agenda for my commissionership. I've been very honest about the fact that um, I'm sort of pleased to have tens of thousands of great men and women, and I'm always mindful that they listen to my words, um, as do the people of London who we, who we serve. Um, and we're all equally horrified that we have hundreds in policing who shouldn't be here. And David Carrick is an example of, an awful example of that. I must sort of reiterate here my sincere apologies to his victims for our failings. He should not have been a police officer. Um, that's very obvious. Um, a range of poor policy and poor decision making. He shouldn't have been a police officer and we failed. And we haven't, we haven't applied the same sense of ruthlessness to guarding our own integrity that we routinely apply to confronting criminals. And I'm deeply sorry for that. I think we failed as investigators, um, where we should have been more intrusive and joined the dots over his repeated misogyny over decades. And as leaders, our mindset should have been more determined to spot and root out such a misogynist. So as I say, I apologise to his victims, and I want to say sorry to all the w women across London <coughs> who feel let down by this and whose trust in policing is shaken by this. I want to talk about three things that we're doing. I want to talk about action, about review, um, and about acceleration. So about action, I promised action from day one. Um, four months ago, I set out that we be ruthless at rooting out those who corrupt our integrity. Um, we've increased the resources in our Department of Professional Standards significantly. We've established an anti-corruption and abuse command. Um, and uh, we've launched the first ever uh, uh, public appeal line through Crime Stoppers, the Crime Stoppers Police Integrity Hotline. Um, and we're getting sort of tens of calls a week to that that are leading us to uh, look at new cases. Some of those turn out to be malicious, but some of them turn out to be substantive, and those are generating new caseload. And I think in some ways, the sort of tragedy of the situation we find ourselves in, we are leading the way. It's interesting that even though this is a met appeal, one in three of the calls coming through roughly are to, for other forces that we're passing information on as well. So um, I think we're sort of, through our, uh, our challenges, we're helping the rest of policing confront some issues as well. That's some of the action we're taking so far. Um, I want to talk about review and redress. Um, Clearly, in terms of this particular case, the Home Secretary, I think, has rightly suggested that um, Lady Ailey Shangelini widens the scope of her uh, review um, to include this case, um, and will support that fully. Okay. In terms of things that we're doing, um, I want to talk about um, Operation Onyx and about uh, um, use of data to review the vetting of all officers and staff. So in terms of um, Operation Onyx, or Project Onyx, what is very clear, isn't it, is that we have, if we haven't been tough enough in our decision making previously, you have to look back at previous cases and say, are there other cases that we got wrong where we decided somebody was going to stay in the organisation and, and in hindsight that's wrong. So we've cast the net very wide. Um, if you look at, so we've looked at a de last decade, officers and staff who have had an allegation which has any hint of uh, uh, of sort of, uh, of um, uh, sexual misconduct or, um, uh, uh, or domestic abuse. So these range from um, sort of less serious allegations that are sort of largely sort of verbal, for example, all the way through to serious sexual assault allegations. Every one of them has been previously investigated and dealt with as either criminality or misconduct and um, come to a position where those people have remained in the organisation. What we have to work out is, did we get those decisions right? Some of the reporting in the papers is this is a thousand new cases, not a thousand new cases. It's reviewing old cases. And given what, but given what we have found so far with um, the cases that have come to light, like Carrick, we have to assume that but whilst I'd be confident that many of the cases we got right, we have to accept that we'll probably find many cases we got wrong and there'll be people there that we need to have a fresh look at. That might be about their vetting, that might be about reopening investigations. There's all sorts of actions we might take, but the first thing is to systematically review that. And that's a massive piece of work to do that. 
to do that thoroughly. The second piece of review um, and redress work that we're, um, we're doing is around a refreshed look at betting. So uh, members might sort of remember from different conversations you've had, but whilst the Police National Computer has criminal records, criminal convictions on it, um, and we're confident we know all the officers who have criminal convictions, um, and people shouldn't be too troubled necessarily about that in itself, because if someone's got a caution as a 13-year-old for possession of cannabis, that's not going to rule them out being a police officer. So, so there's lots of good reasons why people have been there as well as bad reasons. But more importantly, the Police National Database, PND, has a much wider intelligence set of arrests and other incidents that go beyond convictions. So we've washed the data. Um, technical people understand what this means better than I do. We've washed all of our data, of our personnel data, so all of our people, officers and staff, against the PND to look, are, are there officers or staff who've had contact with the police that may be troubling that we don't know about? Now, you do that wash and you get a big pile of potential positives, which will include positives and false positives. And then that creates a big manual process to sift through those hits. And that's what we're working on at the moment. And that, so, that's, so that, that's that refresh vetting approach that I've heard talked about. I just wanted to explain it in a bit more detail there. And that's the tactic that um, we're the first people to do it at scale. And that's a tactic that the um, Home Secretary has now asked that all forces do, the, do that tactic as well. Um, I, I was, on Monday, I, was with, I spent a day with professional standards teams across two or three buildings across London. And the sort of the positive thing in all this, the sort of all the people in there, they're absolute, they're, they're just ordinary police officers who happen to have moved into those roles, um, some recently, some long time ago. Their passion and commitment to take this on was really, um, really uplifting. The last thing I want to say was about accelerating, um, trying to find faster ways to deal with this. Louise Casey commented on the speed of our cases and we're trying to improve that. We are unduly restricted by the nature of our regulations and that concerns me and it's great that the Home Secretary and Prime Minister have commissioned a rapid review of some of the rules about dismissals and unsatisfactory performance. But despite, regardless of that, we're trying to find other levers ourselves where we can stretch the existing use of the law a bit further and push the, push the boundaries on that to, to go as fast as possible in what we're doing. But if I step back, just to finish off, um, you will see progress from us step by step as we chase more trust, less crime and high standards, which I'm focusing on here. Um, we must improve dramatically for London. But lifting the stone and revealing painful truths will not be resolved overnight and i mustn't pretend it will do and i hope you you understand that that can't be done we have to prepare for more painful stories as we confront the issues that we face um we've we've discussed before sort of the systemic failings that create these problems of these officers who corrupt our integrity and as we put in more resource, more assertive tactics, as we are more open to people reporting incidents to us from within and from without the organisation, as we more determinedly take on these cases, it will tackle the problems that we face, but it won't, it won't be rapid and it will be painful. And in that context, um, we need your support and the support of people of London. Um, please don't lose heart as we confront these issues as we do this necessary and painful work to con finally confront those and rid the organisation of those who corrupt our integrity. Thank you, Chair. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Sir Mark. Um, in, in, rela in relation to that, I'm, I'm pleased to hear the vetting uh, is being looked at. Would it, would it be better if it was a vetting service for the, all of the um, police commands in, 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 the, in England? I, I, th <coughs> I think at the moment, because police technology and data is fragmented I, I think doing it centrally would be hard so there's some national databases with some local databases we check um, I think it would be hard to create a national service particularly at this, at this difficult time 
Okay. Uh, later in the meeting, we're going to be talking about trust and confidence, but it, it concerns me greatly, and it must you, that things are going to come out more and more yes. uh, the more you look at. And we look at today's um, uh, ghastly um, reporting on PC Hussein Chihab, um, who uh, admits four counts of uh, sexual activity with a, a girl aged 13 to 15, and then we find out that he had a role as a, a safer schools officer. Do you want to comment on that particular case? No, it's, a, it's another um, ghastly case, isn't it? Yes. Um, from what we've seen so far, he's, it, it, it does look like his he's vetting had been done. The sexual contact offences took place before he joined the police, but um, sadly they weren't known. And then uh, whilst he was in the police, he was taking part in what you might sort of It is, it is ghastly and it's really, it's going to be really, obviously, you've got to apologise to the, the victims. They shouldn't be facing that at the hands of a police officer and, and their families. Um, but also it's another one of these cases which will trouble the people of London. And I'm, I say I'm sorry for that and we're going to keep going back to cases like this as we, as we surface them. Yes, and of course we're all sorry for that because not only are these cases ghastly, but it, what it must be doing to the rest of your workforce who... Most are absolutely um, full of integrity and must feel it yeah. far more than even we do, and, which and, is and shocking they're, they're, for them. They both want this sorted out, and they're massively frustrated that most of the conversation about the Met is about this side of it rather than the amazing work most of them are doing day in and day out. Yes, and of course, um, I never got to a question to the mayor, but we see just how many of our very brave peace police officers are actually injured at work, and they take all that on board. I exactly. mean, the, those figures are uh, astonishing. Um, do you feel that you're empowered to lead the change that the um, that is needed to turn the Met round? Are you being assisted by politicians and everybody else? Do you feel? Do you feel supported? I. I I do at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Watch this space. <laughs> um, um, politics moves quickly, doesn't it? But I do feel yes. very supported at the moment. I, I, I found the, um, uh, the mayor consistently and the, and the Home Secretaries I've worked with very supportive. Um, they're troubled by the challenges faced by policing and they're keen that we progress and turn things around as quickly as possible. And uh, the things that we've asked for um, have our lives are being supported like the um for example the review um of some of the regulations that we've asked for being by the home office or um uh, the mayor making sort of full use of his sort of powers to sort of um, help us with our budget this year okay and you you commented to us uh, <coughs> late last year that there were a hundred or so officers that you wouldn't dare put near the public is there any way you'll be able to deal with that so that's one of the things in Accelerate, we're looking at different ways that we can interpret the regulations and see if we can make more progress on that. Certainly the review work that the Home Office will do should give us new routes to deal with them, but um, I'm looking at whether we can use more inventive legal measures. Okay, well, let's hope you can. Um, just to digress very slightly before we go back into this, um, we've obviously a lot has come out about probation in the last couple of days for obvious reasons. And then I read today that one person is killed every six days by criminals on probation, which I must say I didn't know. Clearly this is for the whole country, not, not just London, which is absolutely shocking. Uh, do the problems that probation, obviously probation have got problems, does that increase workload for the police? I, think Zara, I mean, the Zara Elena case is an awful case, and I think the Director of Probation and the Minister have, have apologised for... Um, the clear mistakes that come out in um, come out in that case, uh, we try to work really um, really hard with probation. Um, they are they do recognise their role in protecting the people of London, um, but clearly they've got issues they need to be able to account for that I can't speak to. Okay, fair enough. Um, going back to David Carrick, if I can ask Diana Lutchford, please, at what point was Mopac made aware of the allegations against David Carrick? Uh, so we were uh, sorry. Um, we were first aware, we were informed of his arrest um, in October 2021. Okay, and what, what is MOCPAC doing to support the Met in ensuring that, uh, that officers like this um, don't enter the Met? Or what, what assistance are you giving the Met? Um, well, um, 
that there's a kind of a history to this in the sense that uh, clearly over the years we have been talking to the Met about um, strengthening misconduct uh, systems and for example our MOPAC's evidence and insight have produced two research reports uh, including one uh, in 2016 identifying the issue of disproportionality in misconduct which was uh, which has been published and was actually noted during uh, noted as part of Louise Casey's interim report so we've been doing research on these issues um, Clearly, we don't get involved in individual misconduct cases because those are an operational matter. Um, but um, we have also been talking to the Met over time about supervisory ratios because obviously it's very difficult for uh, more senior officers to identify negative behaviours or what, whatever else may be going on, the more uh, officers that they are responsible for supervising. So those, th those are some of the kind of strategic uh, issues that we've been discussing with them. We're also, uh, after the Cousins sentencing, it was of course the Mayor who um, called for Louise Casey's uh, review to be set up. He, he sought for that to be commissioned after the cousin sentencing. So uh, he was, you know, playing, he asked them to establish the independent review. And that followed our very serious concerns about sort of culture within the Met, which the cousin's case demonstrated. Um, and also, of course, we are uh, supporting the Met around uh, the reform of police regulations. Uh, so where the legislative framework is inhibiting their efforts to uh, root out corrupt officers, we're working with them uh, to, to help distill the, the, the forthcoming, the, the Home Office review, which I think has actually now kicked off. Okay. Well, I, I'm glad to hear that you are helping. Uh, the report you mentioned is five, six years old. What, what evidence uh, could you give us that you would picked up that there were problems uh, with the culture in the Met? Where, where where could we look up that MOPAC was doing its job looking at that? Um, well, as I say, we have been working with them on issues like supervi supervisory ratios, yeah, but, and we have been talking to them about the culture, and we are now um, regularly meeting with colleagues from the Directorate of Professional Standards to discuss learning from cases, how yeah. that links to um, HMIC FRS corruption report recommendations, their wider transformation plans, um, Okay. And any emerging so, themes and patterns that so, are coming so out of cases. So point to something that MOPAC had done that actually indicates that you were concerned about that and brought that to the Commissioner's attention before all this. Well, obviously, as I say, we don't get involved in individual misconduct cases. No, the, the no, mayor's the, role the is culture, to... The culture, the culture in general. Well, the, the culture in general over the past uh, few years, we, uh, as, as was evidenced by uh, discussions with the previous commissioner, was um, a growing area of concern following a series of negative in incidents in which uh, the mayor has uh, described this committee on previous occasions, including um, the, the, the deaths of Bieber Henry and Nicole Smallman. Um, okay. the, the, right, the Daniel Morgan case, so on and so forth. There was a whole litany of them which uh, reinforced the Mayor's view that an independent review was needed. Which yeah, no, is why I, I know then. I, it was before because I'd never picked it up from MOPAC as being an issue, but I'm very pleased to hear you're assisting the Met now. I'll now go to Assemblymember Desai. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, panel. Uh, Commissioner, firstly, can I welcome your determination to, um, uh, to, to use your words, improve dramatically. Um, that's very reassuring. I can also commend you for all the work that you've done uh, in the last three or four months. Um, so, yeah, so it's welcome news. Uh, and what I particularly welcome is that uh, I think there's been a change of approach in the Met, away from a mode of self-denial to actually accepting that there are serious issues uh, to be grappled with. Commissioner, um, your opening statement actually really covered the supplementaries I was going to ask you, but uh, I will still put one question to you, which to some extent you already answered, but I, st I still will put this to you. So regarding uh, David Carrick, how was this violent predator able to serve in the police for a number of years, decades even, and the pattern of his behavior go unnoticed and investigated? What was going wrong? Now, I know in your answer to us what you are doing, sort of you have answered the qu my question to some extent, but in 2017, Thames Valley Police spoke to him. In 2019, he assaulted a woman during a domestic incident. 
the matter was referred to the mat. It was, it was determined he had no case to answer in relation to misconduct. I mean, what was going in the mat at the time? A different commissioner, but you were part of the, well, a very important part of the senior management team as well. So I think if we look back at, at this, there's a combination of poor policy and, and poor decisions. Um, and sort of what I'm not going to say is, well, those policies, well, that was the standards and practices of the day. I don't think that's an acceptable answer if the policies don't make sense. I mean, sometimes we can see why things were different then, but they're different now. Other times, it doesn't actually make sense. So I don't think I don't think that's a don't think that's a defence for for this. Uh, I fundamentally think the at the core of this is an issue about an allegation is made against an officer. It doesn't meet a criminal standard for prosecution. And many of these were investigated by other police forces outside London, Thames Valley, Hertfordshire, etc. So this isn't simply a, a, a met issue. And, and that's, let's assume those officers and those forces did the best they could do. For whatever reason, there wasn't enough evidence to prosecute. Um, and obviously that's a decision that involves CPS generally. The question is, what notice do you take of that after that point? And sometimes on an individual case, when you don't have enough evidence to prosecute, you're still left with a worrying intelligence picture. Sometimes after an investigation, you think, actually, we've investigated this, there's little evidence of any concern about the person it was alleged against. Sometimes you see, actually, no, we still, there's enough in this to make us concerned, even though it doesn't reach a criminal threshold. And too often in the past, that wasn't thought about and said, well, no criminal prosecution, no, nothing further to see here, push it to one side and we can carry on as normal. So that was the individual issue. And then there's the system issue that even if that's the right decision on one case or two cases, you, you start to get more cases not looking at the system points. And Louise Casey, in her interim review, she's got her final review coming in the next couple of months, her interim review, which focused on the misconduct process, one of her points, if you recall, was I think her phrase was about joining the dots, actually seeing these patterns of behaviour. And certainly um, with this individual, even if individual cases didn't provide a lot of evidence to justify dramatic intervention, as you start to see the pattern build over the years, it certainly should have done and it didn't. So, that, so that's what we've got to fix, which is what, why we go into um, uh, Anti-Corruption Abuse Command, part of the resources there about increased intelligence, looking at our vetting again, because of course the, um, the thousand people who, we've, um, who we're looking at in, um, in Project Onyx um, are across more than a thousand cases. So some of them have got multiple cases as, as you might expect. So, so that systematic look has not been done as wisely. So that's the, that's the failing and that's what we've got to fix. And I'm sure underneath it, there's probably some cultural issues. It's not just system and policy. I've described there's some cultural issues in terms of people's judgment. Um, but fundamentally, those are, the, those are the failings of cause. And that's why I think when you look at these sort of actions I went through, and I'm not going to repeat them all again, you can see how they're picking off the sort of systemic issues in terms of vetting and data, looking at the picture, being more proactive, more resources in that space. It's all about the same issue. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Assembly Member Pigeon. Thank you very much, and thank you for the detail at the beginning, um, which probably answers some questions we may be planning later on, but actually um, shows how much is going on. You said a thousand people yeah. uh, have been pulled out from this big review you've done. But how many are there outside of that thousand, such as the case we've had today, that you know are going through the justice system that we might see coming out in the coming weeks and months? Uh, so. Uh, I mean, looking at this of just the next few weeks ahead, um, uh, most most weeks there's two or three officers going to court for um, criminal cases, um, which tends to be a a mix of sort of dishonesty, violence, and sort of violence against women and girls type mm -hmm. offences, domestic abuse, sexual offences, etc. So there's probably two or three a two or three a week that are sort of appearing at court. It's hard to know when these cases will come to conclusion mm. because sometimes they leap forward um, because something that was a, a court process hearing, all of a sudden someone decides to change and plead to guilty. So exactly when these cases are finalised isn't always clear. Um, 
but there's a there's a there's a trickle of them and we're going to be surfacing more as i said earlier of course of course you are but there's already two or three a week you're expecting yeah. to come out which is horrific um how long is it going to take you to get through this thousand odd cases so i've said we've trying to moving heaven and earth to, we've got to do it thoroughly to mm. have got through it all by the end of march and i said i'll report publicly at that point and what that will say is well uh, we've gone through the thousands there were sort of sort of x that actually we're happy we're not concerned about there are y that we're now putting into wet vetting reviews there are z that we're now putting into fresh investigations mm. so sort of it'd be that sort of but that sort of update we'll be able to get to. That's that's what we're looking to do. That's the initial bit, and then there'll be months, obviously. And the months of doing those, of those. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And in terms of your, your boosted professional standards unit dealing with this work, how many officers have you got in there, and how confident are you about the quality and integrity of those officers, given we saw um, come out recently a constable in that particular unit is now being investigated over alleged sexual assault of a female colleague? That worries me that you've got people in there who may have a different judgment uh, and may review cases in the wrong way because perhaps their own behaviour has not always been good. Yeah. We've worked hard on the vetting of the people in that unit. Um, I was with them yesterday and I was impressed by the people um, mm -hmm. I met. I mean, sort of, and for example, on the, on the sort of sexual offending side, um, we've basically built a you know you, you've looked at it in the past and i think you've had a recent session with um, commander southworth about our public protection work mm. more generally we've basically built a public protection team in uh, in sort of professional standards so those officers who are highly skilled at dealing with victims of um uh, of, sort of, of rape sexual assault domestic abuse because of all the nuances that come with those cases in terms of specialist um evidence gathering um uh, the particular um, importance of victim support and uh, the particular tactics in doing that in a way that works for women who are victims of such, of such crimes. So we've actually built a dedicated, so all the officers in that, um, so a large part of them have got specialist experience mm -hmm. in that world, um, led by a very impressive detective superintendent. So we're, sort of, we're trying to get all the right skills and capabilities in there to be able to do as good a job as we can do. The total number, I can't remember the total number, we can come back to you on that. Sort of, I think we increased it by about 30%, but I can come back to you with the exact that numbers. Helpful. That, 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 that's good to hear. And then, as part of this almost retrospective work you're doing, there is an issue that officers will have left the police and staff, and there may be reasons for that, the behaviour of colleagues and so on. Um, I was reading a really interesting piece um, in one of the newspapers, um, I News, about an officer who left within 11 months. They'd come from the criminal justice service. They had a lot of experience that could really benefit the police. And it was a culture of dehumanising language, cutting corners, the sort of words she used, uh, what she has used to describe how they call members of the public the team she was with. Now, clearly, this is not all police officers, but they're... Are you going to look at talking to officers who've left to find out if there are particular reasons, again, to feed into this massive cultural review that you're doing? Yeah, so we, ha we have done, we have done um, some of that, and we're always interested in, in, in that feedback. And it's very obvious, isn't it, that our, we, uh, sort of our attrition, so as we look at recruiting and attrition, mm. our attrition is, uh, is higher than we would like it to be. Um, and it must be possible, and it's likely to be true, that some of that is because some people are having a bad experience. Yes. One of the things that struck me um, when the Louise Casey report was published and we were talking about that and talking with officers about how this is not pervasive because lots of officers um, have very positive experiences and I had um, I had sort of sort of young black officers say to me I'm angry about this report because this isn't true mm. this is a fantastic organization it's the best place I've ever worked but then you have another black officer doing the same job on a different team saying it's exactly true and I'm angry because you haven't dealt with this. And which sort of, it goes to the point about this is, this is pockets, Pocket. but Teams. it's too many yeah. pockets that exist because systematically we haven't been good enough. Mm. And that's the, that's the, and so it's finding those pockets. And one of the things for the anti-corruption abuse command to do is to be more proactive using more sort of um, covert techniques mm. where we're just going live with our sort of um, lawful business monitoring, which is about being able to monitor internal communications more um, as, sort of uh, more intrusively where there's where there's good cause. So using all those yeah. tactics, 
where we identify teams that we are concerned about. Lovely, and exit interviews, of course, as exactly, well. Yeah, Lovely. Exactly. I'll, I'll leave it there, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. And, of course, the fire brigade are finding exactly the same. There's pockets yeah. of issues. Colleagues, we're going to have to step up the pace, please. Assembly Member Mayama. Thank you. Um, my question is, is for Sir Mark. My first one has been answered. Um, but I just wanted to ask you, so Londoners will note that um, David Carrick is from the same command as Wayne Cousins. And um, we've heard in the past, you know, there are some bad apples, but it's got to the point where there are so many bad apples, perhaps we need to throw out the whole barrel. Um, and I say that not to kind of say that that's necessarily what needs to happen, but I wonder where you are along that journey. If those pockets are just so intractable, how that's being addressed, if there are clear issues in certain areas. So I think it's really important that uh, no one interprets me saying there's pockets, that it's just a, it's a few bad apples, it's more than that. I think I've been very clear about that. There are s sort of system, system failings. And that's the challenge about being really clear that the majority of our people are really good people and they care about policing London. That's the tens of thousands. Um, but the hundreds have got more traction and there's more of them because we haven't been strong enough and systematically strong enough. And so we are, I'm not going to talk about particular commands generally, we are looking at units, functions and working out where do we have warning signs of, uh, of problematic culture. That might be about high complaints records, it might be about internal reporting, it could be a whole range of different, it could be about um, the demographics of the team and the movement of people in and out and, and, and what that looks like. Um, clearly parliamentary and diplomatic protection has been um, uh, more than one concerning issue and so we've been doing a big review of that. Um, de uh, Deputy Citizen Commissioner um, Helen Milichap has been leading that and that's coming to a conclusion and looking at what are the system issues that affect the culture in that environment and they're finding some quite significant issues. It's an unusual set up protecting a whole load of premises, armed officers having to be on post at particular times and the, the way it's been constructed has undermined the ability of supervisors to supervise just the, the setting of hours and rotors etc and that's a long conversation that is, is not for now but fundamentally so we're looking at those system issues that can set up the leaders and the team to be successful together as well as dealing with the sort of toxic individuals such as the ones you mentioned. Thank you. That's really good to hear and reassuring. And um, really quickly, I just wanted to ask you if you're confident that um, the Met's going to meet the deadline of the 31st of March to identify people from the wash that you talked about of the police national computer. Um, I'm going to move to Helen High Water to get there. It's a, there's a lot to get through, but we're determined to try and do that. Thank you, Assembly Member Devonish. Uh, thank you. Good morning, Sir Mark. Um, I wanted to get back a point you made a, a little bit earlier in terms of the morale of your staff specifically with this drip 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 of these poisonous cases two or three a week you're saying mm. are going to come through what are you actually doing to uh, raise or increase or or defend morale internally and to reassure your officers and civilian staff there's a better future a better met uh, going forward please so uh, generally publicly I try to keep coming back to the point that we have tens of thousands of great people. Unfortunately, the bit that gets, that's never the bit that gets reported, frankly. Um, and so it, frus it, it, it frustrates them. They, they understand why that is, but it's, it's, a, it's frustrating for good people who are in, in, a, in a profession and care about, um, care about what they do. So keep trying to get the positive stories out there, but there isn't always the bandwidth for them. Um, internally, there are... Um, Part one, if, when we talk about sort of uh, plans going forward and the, and the sort of draft strategy we've, we've published recently, the turnaround plan, um, one of the strands in there is about setting officers up to succeed because they feel there are various issues about how their, their duties are managed, about their equipment, about technology, the whole range of issues like that which could be better. So trying to make sure that their working environment and the tools and equipment and support they feel around them um, is as good as it can be because they don't feel it is at the moment. I think that's, that's a fair judgment and we're going to try and tackle that. And in terms of specific numbers, have you got any retention figures? Because clearly we're in a wonderful jobs market in London at the moment and they can all go and get a better job elsewhere in terms of money. So in terms of retention numbers, you got anything you could publish to show that the number hasn't gone down, dipped during this crisis over the last year or so? And if it has, how it's going to go back up in terms of retention, please? So uh, uh, we can sort of right in due course with some detailed numbers but the over the last year 
our aspiration to grow our police numbers in line with sort of national and local investment is getting more and more difficult. Um, we are um, going to be high hundreds behind our target for the end of March. I think we've said some of that publicly before, but I'll say it again. So, we're, and that is a that is a combination of sort of it's the, it's both the recruitment and the retention. So the, re the retention issues are um, steadily creeping up in terms of the numbers um, leaving and recruiting. I think we've recruited somewhere around nine and a half thousand in the last three years. So I think there's a, there's an element of there's probably only so many people who want to be police officers and you sort of start to sort of um, exhaust the market. There's certainly the pay competitiveness. I'm very, I'm very concerned about police officer pay um, and some of the stories I hear and some of the research that has been published recently about that. So I think but, but sort of clearly the operating environment and the sort of, and the, and the public debate will affect those issues as well. And so we are looking hard at what can we do to try and improve that. But it's, it's it's very difficult, and there's a the next pay round of reviews is really important for police officers. I think. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, there's the extra PCSO is coming in, which is very welcome. Do they go through the exactly the same vetting as police officers? I'd have to double check that. It's very similar. Uh, it's, it's certainly very similar. I think there's a little bit more that police officers have, but it's 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 very similar. Actually, if at some point that we could yeah. be told that, that'd be grateful. Assembly Member Russell. Uh, yes, I just wanted to pick up on the uh, Safer Schools Officer um, issue that has come out yes. today. Um, you said that uh, the sexual uh, misconduct offences happened before uh, that officer joined the police and then the grooming activity happened while he was working in the police as a safer schools officer. Yeah. So that obviously has um, huge implications in terms of vetting and safeguarding and also makes one wonder whether are you are you thinking about what the role of safer schools officers is? You know, what are police officers doing in schools? Are they being used in a constructive way to divert young people from the criminal justice system? Or is it actually introducing risk into our schools? Um, we've had child Q. The, you know, this isn't the first case of a problem happening within the setting of a school. So do you have any advice for head teachers who have safer schools officers in their schools? So uh, uh, sort of, this is obviously a concerning case and uh, our sort of local um, BCU command teams are speaking, sort of are, are communicating with, um, with head teachers and, and um, will update them. We, ha we do, um, do extra vetting for schools officers. Um, the, the issues in this case is Sadly, none of the offences that he committed before joining the police had been reported until more recently, so there was no way we could have known about that. Um, so it, it looks like the vetting procedures were, um, were sort of sensible, but sadly he was clearly an inappropriate person we now know to be in a school. Um, we've got a bit more work to do to, to double check whether there's anything we could have spotted done to spot that. In terms of the role going forward, um, as part of, you've heard me talk about strongest ever neighbourhood policing and sort of schools officers are a part of police and communities working together to deal with issues. Um, the vast majority of people I see in, um, sort of in education welcome that sort of positive relationship and working, to, as you say, to divert people from crime, spotting problems early and helping divert young people out of crime has to be, has to be an ambition, particularly when we see issues like county lines and, and, and those areas where um, young people um, perhaps at a difficult moment in their, um, in their growing up get drawn into those issues and spotting that early between teachers and police and trying to find ways to deal with it I think is really important. So that, that, that's the mission. We've clearly got a tragic case here, um, but that shouldn't deter us from the positive work that schools officers work doing working with teachers and others to reduce crime. Mm -hmm. the, I mean, it is... It, it, emphasizes the importance of safeguarding because the first I mean, it, it sounds like if the other issues hadn't been reported before he went through the vetting process then the grooming in the school was the first activity and and so it's yes. you know what I, I suppose the thing to take away is what can you learn from that to protect other people in other schools um, and it'll be interesting to see how that works exactly. forward Agreed. thank you
think it also shows that people, if there is a crime committed, must report it as yes. soon as they possibly can, because it, as in this case, then at least you'd have been alerted to it before yes. uh, the gentleman was put into schools. Okay, Assembly Member Garrett. Morning. Two quick issues that have come up, if I may, sum up. Firstly, this question of you mentioned two to three officers per week is the sort of par rate of officers yeah. going through the court. I just wondered what's, what does the h historical trend of that look like and what does the future in your hopes and dreams look like? Is that just a kind of baseline level of people who you would just expect to see? Because it feels to me like quite a high number even for an organisation of 35,000 odd people. Um, it, it's a it's a higher number than I wanted to be in the long term, but it, it sort of we're going to see a lot happening over the forthcoming months. And I mean, so all of these ex so for example, all these extra reports coming in at the moment from our appeals, some of those some of those will turn into criminal investigations. Um, if one of those reported today becomes a criminal investigation, if it's a guilty plea, it probably won't be some till sometime in twenty. 24 and if it's a trial it might not be till 2025 just to give you a sense of sort of uh, particularly with the current um log jam in the uh, in the criminal justice system in london so so that's a a sense of the timeline that we're going to face um we have historic records in terms of i think dismissals etc the sort of the number appearing at court i think is it, it it's not something we have reliable data on frankly uh, what i see is what i can see coming up in the next few weeks of course, some of those cases appear multiple times. I think, well, they might plead guilty today or they might go to trial. So that, that name in this week's two or three is the same name in the two or three in a month's time and three months' time as well. So that's it's, it's just the ongoing business. OK, f fair enough. The other, the other question that came up was about um, uh, retention and also about assaults on police officers, which is, you know, un un unfortunately part of the line of work of, of a police officer. So w one of the... So, so my question is, how well are officers, frontline officers, supported if they're assaulted in their work? How are they supported, not just in terms of immediate first aid, but in terms of the sense of this is an organisation that is looking after me and that is going after the person and taking seriously the fact that a person has assaulted me in the line of my work? Is that something that the Met's always been good at? Is it something that you're working to improve? So it, uh, we have a, there's a protocol, there's a national protocol that we follow. So um, Hampshire Police develop this and so in the Met we call this Op Hampshire because everything has to have an operational name doesn't it which is something that something something that Diana says but sort of the, there's a set of protocols about the follow-on with officers um, I, I'm going to keep so there's the welfare side of it another key part of it is actually treating them as a victim um, one of the issues in the past was sort of it, it was not treating an officer as a victim in the same way you would a member of the public um, so you, you know, you've gone through a traumatic incident. Well, you write your own statement. It sort of used to be. It isn't that anymore. So, so it's sort of, it's being sort of more um, sympathetic in that way. But it starts right at the sort of at, right at the scene. Um, we had an incident um, a week ago where an officer was um, uh, badly assaulted, making an arrest, and his his heart stopped, um, and his life was saved by his colleagues with a um, uh, with a defibrillator. And that's the second time that's happened in my four months as commissioner that. We have an officer who's alive um, because colleagues uh, because colleagues literally save their life with immediate first aid um, and that sort of uh, really sort of upsets and troubles me that that happens that frequently but the, the support from colleagues is fantastic I think maybe asked the question it was a story that I was reading this morning it outside the Met but it was an officer who was assaulted the person who assaulted him was only given a caution part of the caution was to write a letter of apology to the officer so firstly the officer was annoyed that, it, that, that, that the level of sanction was just a caution and secondly the sanction within the caution of writing the letter of apology never even happened the force didn't seem to this officer's mind very keen on making it happen and eventually he left the force because he thought this is not a place that values my time or my injuries is that is that the sort of thing that a Met officer might face I would hope not frankly I would hope not I, I wanted to take these issues seriously um, I think there are um, at least sentencing guidelines and sort of expectations in terms of sentencing for this area but I, I, I do think it could be taken more seriously the assaults on police officers I think it is a, a big issue and I think it it should be seen like sort of I know contempt of court or something it's actually sort of fundamentally obstructing and impeding justice in a very uh, a completely unacceptable way and it should be seen as something which in 
a large portion of cases people get custodial sentences. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, and I agree with that. Protect the protectors is something I've always absolutely supported. Um, unfortunately, with all these things coming out, it sort of muddies the water somewhat, and that's not fair to yes. all those exceptionally good uh, officers out there absolutely. who we will thank every single day for what they do, putting themselves in so much danger. Um, nevertheless, we must get through this very difficult time. Our next section is on trust and confidence, which, of course, is all all ties into what we've just been talking about. Colleagues, we are running very late, as uh, you will know. Um, if your question has been covered, um, please don't ask it again. Um, so first of all, we're going to go to Assemblymember Ahmed. Thank you very much, Chair. Good morning, panel. Ms Ludford, what specific work is MOPAC doing to support the Met in rebuilding trust and confidence, including action to reduce disproportionalities in levels of trust between different groups of Londoners? Um, <clears throat> So uh, we've taken significant action to help address the issue of, uh, of trust and confidence and of course that is why terrible incidents like Carrick are of such great concern because they further damage the trust and confidence of Londoners which, which means you know, it's an on, this is an ongoing issue for us. Um, I mean, for example, we've overseen a whole-scale uh, overhaul of the uh, Met's gangs matrix due to the uh, annual reviews uh, which MOPAC conducted which has resulted in more than 1,200 people who are deemed low risk being taken off the matrix. And in fact, the database is now at its lowest number since 2012, which we hope will uh, increase trust and confidence. One of the really significant things was, of course, the mayor's action plan to improve trust and confidence, uh, particularly among black communities. Um, and I'm sure that uh, Kenny can give more, more, more detail about that, but that was particularly about the disproportionate use of police powers on, on black Londoners. Um, we, as a result of the road traffic stops pilot uh, within the action plan, uh, which um, saw the Met recording vehicle stops to make sure that they are identifying any disproportionality relating to ethnicity, that has actually uh, now been picked up in the National Police Race Action Plan. Uh, they've, they, they've taken our lead and they're developing a, a new code of practice to, to drive change in that area. Uh, we've also been scrutinising the, uh, Met, the Met's use of strip searching uh, for some time, indeed prior to the publication of the Child Q report um, through the MOPAC oversight, oversight Board, which is something that we uh, committed to as part of the action plan. And we're beginning to see some results from that very, very important work. Uh, for example, in the last quarter, the, um, the, de the Met conducted 16 more thorough intimate Part searches on children, which uh, represents a 64% reduction uh, on last year, uh, which is really, really positive. Um, and we're also doing work to progress uh, tackling disproportionality in youth justice um, and, and many other things. I don't know if there's anything you'd wish to add, particularly on the action plan, Kenny. Um, so, sorry, forgive me, Mr. Bowie. We're, we're running out of time. Okay, Thank sure. you, Ms. Love. That was quite thorough. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Commissioner. Um, but before I ask my question, I'd just like to pay tribute to the officers that save not only their colleagues' lives every day, but members of the public's Thank lives. You. Um, in my constituency, as you know, just before Christmas, there was the awful incidents of, uh, incident of the O2 Academy in Brixton. And I would publicly like to reiterate again and pay tribute to the officers who saved members of the public's lives that night and I don't think that's spoken about enough so thank you to those officers I was lucky enough just a few days ago to do a night shift from Peckham police station on a Friday night with with the, with a team and I cannot I really cannot impress how Im how impressed I was with the professionalism. We had a suicide attempt, we had a stabbing, and just watching how the officers dealt with that, like a machine, you know, they went in like a machine. It was an amazing thing to do, and it was and watching the officers in action was amazing. Thank you. Uh, going back to my questions, Commissioner, what are the immediate priorities for the turnaround board? How will these be delivered? Who sits on it and how many times has it met? Thank you. So we've been creating a, a turnaround plan which we published um, last week. So I'm sort of, I'm determined that we get on with things in a hurry um, because there's a lot to do. Um, and 
so we've developed a plan and I'm keen to get feedback on it so rather than hesitating we need to get on and do some things and so having um, done some sort of initial pushes on certain themes in the first um, three months wanted to do that that plan takes account of HMIC reports various other reviews like Morgan and some of the other things that um, uh, Don Oates has mentioned takes account of our performance issues takes account of the fact we're in the engage process takes account of the Casey report and so we've tried to pull all that together and it really does three things it says so under the headline of sort of we're going to deliver more trust less crime high standards it's like how are we going to measure and assess that and drive performance improvements how are we going to deal with improving the way our values um, build a healthy organization that everyone succeeds in and what are the what are the priorities for change what are the most important things we have to tackle to improve what we do for london and those are the those nine priorities for for, for change as part of doing that I was keen that we sort of look outside for others' ideas and comments. And so uh, the turnaround board is um, helping us as a, sort of, as a challenge panel and sort of to, to help criticise, challenge and improve the quality of that plan. So um, we've got um, uh, community representatives, we've got um, HMIC are there, we've got um, a, a local authority chief exec. Um, obviously Mopac are there so sort of except so and, it, and we've it's met three or four times since I started and it's going to keep meeting as that external challenge so that our planning isn't just in our on our own um, the other thing it's doing so we've also got the, the chair of the College of Policing Chief Constable Andy Marsh the other thing we're looking for is to bring in best practice from elsewhere so so the College of Police will say well actually if you're trying to fix this issue Force X is really good at that, or and HMIC can help as well. So it's about getting outside in help and getting different opinions as we try and focus on where we're going. And of course, this plan is only a working draft. We're going to crack on with it, but over the next three months, before we get to the first of April, we'll have Louise Casey's next report. There'll be other things, and, it, and we'll get feedback from perhaps yourselves and others, and that will lead to sort of refinement of it. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Could you tell us a little bit about the Leadership Academy and what? you are hoping this will deliver and what progress has been made in establishing it uh, we don't invest enough in our leaders that's a uh, an absolute challenge for us almost the vast vast majority of leadership training that officers get is entirely operational so learning to be a firearms commander or a senior detective which is about uh, and those those technical skills are of course important but in terms of leading and managing um, teams of staff, setting standards, um, thinking about how you connect to London and how you place a city as, 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 as complex as, as London, we don't put very much investment in that. An interesting comparison, if you look at our chief superintendents who are running um, big units with maybe 1,500 officers, um, if you compare those to, to um, colonels in the, in the, in the army, um, an army colonel since leaving Sandhurst will have had 72 weeks of leadership development. Our chief superintendents, if they've had a handful, they're lucky. Um, that is an extraordinary difference. So now I'm not going to be doing 72 weeks of it. Sort of, that's not that's, that's sort of uh, if only. Um, but my stake in the ground, of I want every leader in the Met to be getting a week's leadership development each year. That's the stake in the ground that I put, and that's what the academy is going to try and deliver. So we're going to sort of try and repurpose some of Hendon is probably the right answer to this. Um, we want to work with the College of Policing. We want to work with perhaps a London sort of um, like business school type institution, um, uh, and um, we want to work with London's communities and some of the groups in terms of how we how we do that. Um, the team at the moment are focusing on developing a package for sergeants for the next couple of years. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And on the back of what uh, Assemblymember Ahmed said, I would urge anybody that scrutinises the police or throws stones at them, comments on them, to actually go out on some of these police shifts from literally walking the beat to I've, I've been out with the firearm officers, etc. Their professionalism is astounding, and perhaps it would make people think twice before they just freely throw, throw you bricks much. at you, as it were. Assemblymember Devonish. Well said.
Well said, Chair. <laughs> and uh, short answers, please, uh, Sir Mark, to these questions because we're behind okay. time. What are the key learning points from the innovation hubs the Met held across London? And how will the Met take this forward to improve trust and confidence, please? Uh, so those have been focused on um, different crime reduction initiatives in local areas, getting different groups together. I don't have a sort of hit list of one top four or five things, but perhaps I can write back to you afterwards. That would be great. Um, you have said that the Met will, a quote, will build the strongest ever neighbourhood policing model this city has ever seen, end quote. What does this actually look like? When will Londoners uh, expect to see real change? And can I just add one further point? The 500 PCSOs that have been announced by the mayor a couple of weeks ago, how will that demonstrate uh, change in addition to what we're discussing? Uh, so we have... There's multiple issues to be dealt with here. At the core of this, I want policing that is, I've described it as community crime fighting, precise community crime fighting. So police and communities tackling crime together. That's how we succeed best. Policing shouldn't be imposed. It should be done, should be done jointly. And we haven't always got that tone right. The neighbour policing resources are the cornerstone of that approach, but they're not the whole of it. So just starting there, our neighbour policing resources are lower than they were a decade ago for a whole range of obvious reasons that you'll un all understand. Um, I want to rebuild that. Uh, the number of police officers there on paper is comparable to what it was a decade ago, but the abstraction levels are, um, are too high, and that's something you've discussed here before. So, so getting that more reliable is important. PCSO-wise, we're about 1,600 fewer than we were a decade ago um, in neighbourhoods, and um, keen to improve that, and it's great to have the money to start that sort of start that scale. And we're looking at the role of PCS, the role of PCSOs and police officers in neighbourhoods, the work they do, how they have the most impact on crime, how to improve engagement. We're looking at new technologies to get a better, more granular understanding of different communities' concerns. In a, and alongside that, we're going to be looking at how the rest of the Met connects into community policing and connects into neighbourhoods to support their activity. Thank you. Um, I'm told we've recruited now 16,753 of the promised uh, 20,000 uh, government promise. Uh, can you provide an update on when you expect to meet the target of recruiting an additional, the figures 4557 officers here in London? And what discussion have you had with the Home Office about that, please? So I think those numbers you're using there are the national numbers. Yes, um, yeah. I would love to be recruiting 20,000 more officers. Indeed. <laughs> indeed, uh, indeed. So if, if, you've, if you've got a checkbook for that, then I'd be very, very, very <laughs> grateful. Um, so our share of it, I say we're, we've recruited 9,500 officers in the last um, three years, I think the t time span is. We're struggling to get to the finish line in terms of getting quite as high as we need to, as I said earlier, with the conversation about recruitment and retention. Um, and I think we might fall sort of uh, sort of high hundreds um, short of our target by the end of the year and we're looking hard at what levers we can pull to try and to try and get catch that back up but it is a difficult environment all the reasons this earlier pay meets reputation etc and could you write to me on the point that we discussed earlier as well about retention as much as well as recruitment that would yeah. be really in more detail would be really okay. useful to the committee okay. thank you sir mark Okay, uh, the, the problem is recruitment, isn't it? It's not because there isn't the money there. It's yeah, just absolutely. Down. Fine, thank you. Assembly Member Sahota. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. And, and let me echo the comments made by my colleagues of the gratitude we owe to the Metropolitan Police for the hard work you do, and particularly for West London Borough Commander, who keeps me well, well informed of the issues in my part of the world. Great. Um, you've appointed Professor Lawrence Sherman as the Met's first Chief Scientific Officer. Uh, can you please uh, clarify the remit of the ro role and the initial focus of, the work, uh, of his work? Yeah, so I'm very... I'm determined that we are intelligence-led and evidence-based. So the evidence of best practice. Um, uh, Larry Sherman brings with him a, a sort of, he's a globally renowned criminologist. He's last, sort of, latterly sort of professor at Cambridge Criminology Department. Um, what we're looking to do is to bring all that best practice to London and get more rigorous in terms of our working out what works. And some of this is about how you apply data science. You'll have heard me talk previously about sort of using data science to get better identifying um, London's most dangerous predatory offenders, because we've got tens of thousands of uh, sort of men in London who've 
in, in over, over the last few years have got convictions or intelligence about domestic abuse, child abuse, rape, sexual assault, etc. Actually, being able to prioritise that requires sort of data and an analytical approach that leans on criminological evidence. So it's that sort of thing is what we're looking to do. Likewise, we're going to use the same evidence-based approach to thinking about how do we how do we allocate the 500 PCSOs? How do you sort of do that to best effect? If you want to deliver more trust and less crime, where's the best place to put them? So, Professor Sherman, we'll also be looking at not only at the uh, data collection, but also what data is relevant, because there's a difference between data and inf useful information. Absolutely. absolutely. So, so he's got a background in all sorts of um, research using um, data to inform policing, and I say widely cited on sort of global best practice, but across things like we've discussed or stop and search practice, how do you do stop and search differently that increases trust? How do you bring ideas like procedural justice to, um, uh, to stop and search? So there's a, a range of things that we're looking at, and we're uh, having, he's, he's been in post like two or three months, and we're just finalising the sort of work programme that we're working to. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. It's fascinating. We'll be watching that. Thank, Thank you. you. Assemblymember Pigeon. Yeah, just picking up on the data point. Um, Obviously, we touched on earlier about the issues with probation, the prison service, this awful case, Zara, Alina, um, that's been in the news again this week. As you develop these tools within the Met, what will you be doing, or will you be doing anything, with probation, the prison service, for them to be able to use these tools, because you're putting this exactly. investment in that can help keep Londoners safe? Um, very, very keen to do that. There is increasing evidence that... Um, data analysis can massively improve upon human only um, risk assessment uh, you, you still want we don't want a minority report environment if anyone's seen that film where this is also sort of all done by computers that's not the intention mm. but when you've got big volumes of data and complex environments technology can help people make better decisions and there's there's evidence in sort of risk assessment that 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 can be very effective I, I hope you're able to share that yes. tool. And can I, can I just go back? To, you talk about the Leadership Academy. All that is really good to hear. But are you doing a review of Hendon and and how fit for purpose it is in terms of the new policing way forward that you want to develop? Because, you know, a lot of the, the off, ex-officers there, the staff there may be very good. They may be old school, though, and you may want to be refreshing that. So are you looking to review Hendon? So, um, I mean, Hendon's a... A site more than a more than an academy at the moment, but sort of. So we are looking at our, um, recruit training certainly at the moment. As I say, there isn't enough leadership training, and 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 that's why we're doing this um, doing this investment. It's not it's not just our thinking. So we've got the College of Policing involved. We're looking to work with business schools. We want to work with community mm -hmm. groups. So it, this is. This is not going to be a, a Met only designed. I see this very much mm. as a partnership. And so Hendon will be kind of refreshed in all its training. Exactly. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. We're now moving on to reducing crime, which of course hopefully will. I did so want to come in. Oh, beg your pardon. We, we're not moving on, but we'll be quick though, won't I'll we, Assembly I'll Member? Be very quick. Uh, sorry. Um, <laughs> Microphone. Please. Um, Commissioner. Um, <clears throat> Um, I'm sure you will have seen the reporting of the Met's multiple failures in the Sana Mohammed case, including making no effort to contact the Kela and ignoring discovery of a burglary bag outside of her house in a deliberate attempt to avoid paperwork. Commissioner, can you reassure this committee and Londoners that these failures won't happen again and the Met do take the issue of violence against women and girls seriously? I, I need to write back to you on that case. Okay, fine. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Oh, sorry. I think, one, and I one, think you meant to come in under Section 3. But anyway. No, no, no. So, and one final question, Commissioner. Commissioner, so trust and confidence, which is what this section is all about, is about people's own personal experiences, cultural issues, but also perceptions. So it's, it's in that context that I ask you this question. I wrote to you yesterday regarding the party get inquiry and asking you to reopen it. I know you will respond in due course, but I do want to point out that I also feel that this is a key issue for trust and confidence in the mat. The police should operate without fear and favor, and the public need to know that criminality is properly investigated wherever it takes place, that you will go where the evidence takes you, that there's not one law, as many people say it, most people say it, I would say, for the rich and powerful, and another law for others. Wouldn't you agree? 
No. Um, the, the, the <laughs> so you, you do accept that should be one law for well, the there was, about, there, was about, there was about five questions there, yeah. and, I'm not, and I'm not agreeing with all of them. Yeah. Um, no. the, the Met, before I returned, put a lot of resources into doing a big, thorough inquiry, which has now concluded. Um, I've got a lot of very important things to do for Londoners, and it would take something startling to cause me to reopen that, which I think is unlikely. OK, thank you. Well, let's see what the Commons Privileges Committee comes up with. OK, okay. meanwhile, b back in London... Uh, well, we are in London, isn't yes, it? It should affect well, we'll London. We're not very happy with people partying whilst they were obeying COVID rules, right. Chair. OK, thank you very much for that interjection. We're now moving on to reducing crime, which, of course, will help with trust and confidence. It's being started by my colleague, Assemblymember Russell. Thank you, Chair. And um, just briefly, just going back to the um, piece about Professor Lawrence Sherman, um, it was good to hear you say you don't want a minority report situation. Yes. Will you be publishing information so Londoners understand what data is being used in policing and uh, and and what uh, and how it is being used in this more data-driven policing environment? Any, any big strides we make to do things very differently, we'll be very transparent about them. OK, thank you very much. Um, so, um, moving on to the reducing crime um, piece, um, you've talked about the more trust, less crime, higher standards. Um, and I'm just, just briefly but broadly, can you say what concerns you most about current crime trends in London? and? Uh, relating that to your turnaround plan, what part of the turnaround plan is going to be the most challenging to deliver? I'm, I'm not sure I'm... I'm not sure I'm particularly concerned about one part of it. Possibly the um, culture and leadership side is particularly challenging, but actually I think the challenge is the scale of the overall plan and sequencing it and managing those th those things alongside them at each other I think when you look at when you if you read it and think about the the work to do under each of those nine change priorities if you add all that together that's not something that you can rush through in a year and tick off all those we, there's, there's lots of planning a lot of sequencing um, there's difficult issues around technology there's all sorts of issues around people and training and development and, and so Choreographing the whole thing is the bigger challenge, frankly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, so taking it back to one particular area of the turnaround plan, so the is it item three, we're going to pro we will provide a compassionate and effective service to victims and other members of the public. And one of the ways you're going to deliver that is to ensure attendance at every home burglary yes. and, and that it gets reported. Um, so how have you achieved the 80% attendance at residential burglaries in just a few months? Um, and how have officers... The classification for the Home Office crime counting rules is very wide. Mm -hmm. um, my promise is about burglars of people's home, because that's the intrusive bit. Discovering when you go out in spring that sometime in the past six months something's gone out of your shed is not the same as someone invading your home, is it? So that 80 per cent of burglary dwelling classification, I th I'm pretty confident includes pretty much all invasions of people's homes, and we're trying to quality assure the data in a different way to be certain of that. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Assemblymember Prince. Thank you, Chair. Good, good morning, uh, Commissioner. Good morning. Good morning. Um, can you confirm the scope and purpose of Operation Tenacity, please? Yes, thank you. So, uh, Tenacity was uh, is an operation to show how we can be more focused uh, going after the most dangerous offenders. And so, um, we did that over three months before Christmas. And uh, we arrested 2,530 dangerous offenders. Um, we were looking at issues such as um, uh, wanted offenders, absconders from court, various lists that we have, and I saying, can we reduce the numbers that are outstanding if we're uh, if we're more focused on that? And so those 2,530 uh, included 153 rape suspects, 106 for robbery, 174 burglars, etc., um, etc. Et um, and so it's, it was 
very positive. And it's that data-led approach that will help us bring crime down further by being precise, going out. So who are the most dangerous people? How do we use our limited resources to best effect for London? And, and do you have a figure on how many arrests have been made as a result? So, uh, so it was uh, 2,530 leading up to Christmas. Oh, that was the actual number of arrests? Yes. Oh, okay. yeah. Sorry, I misheard you there. OK, thank you. And um, so what progress do you think you've made in your first 100 days to tackle serious and organised crime? And what do you feel are the next steps? Uh, so the first, my first 100 days was really just about testing some new tactics as we started to build the turnaround plan. I think two... Two things I would highlight on the on the uh, success on organised crime. Firstly, uh, our work tackling um, drug supply in London, folk, which is more about reducing violence. So, um, work that started about 18 months, two years ago on <coughs> county lines, um, we've stepped up the resources in that work and. And if you like, started doing work on what you might call city lines, so the, 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 the line selling drugs within London rather than those selling them mm -hmm. further mm -hmm. afield. Uh, we, we're increasing the number of arrests we're making. We get about, I think, nine, uh, well over 90% guilty pleas on those cases because of the methodology we're using, um, using phone data and other things to convict people. Um, what we're finding of the sort of tens of people a week we're arresting for drug supply who are running these lines, these are men of violence. One in ten of them have previously been arrested for murder. One in six of them have been previously arrested for firearms offences. One in three have been previously arrested for grievous bodily harm. Well over 80% have got previous convictions for some sort of weapons or violence offences. And so by going after the men of violence behind the drugs lines, you're having an effect on, uh, on, on violence in London. And, um, of course, some of the spin-offs of those operations are safeguarding cases where you've got some of the young teenagers who've been coerced and pressured into delivering the drugs on their behalf. I think that's partly behind our success <coughs> over the last year in terms of um, uh, reducing murder, where murder was down about, about, about I think, 16 or 17 per cent last year, uh, half the number of teenage suicides in 2022 compared to 2021. And I think a big part of the success in that has been this drive um, on, on this activity. The second highlight I would be where we're experimenting with new methodologies to deal with the sort of plague of online fraud and uh, work we've spoken about before with Operation Labyrinth, where um, we arrested a couple hundred people using a, a sort of an online fraud selling um, website, frankly, fraud methodology selling, and that's um, a massive operation. And we've contacted, I think, 60 or 70,000 victims who we think have been victims of those offenders. Thank you. That's very, very promising. Um, so, theft from person. Uh, sanction detection rates are about 0.7%. Theft from motor vehicles about 0.4%, according to the figures I'm giving here, and taking a motor vehicle 0.9%. Um, what uh, is the Met doing to catch more of these criminals or to improve the sanction detection rate? Uh, so we, we are trying to catch <coughs> more criminals. I mean, if, if, if I sort of step back and so if we have a conversation about crime performance on Serious violence, we're doing well. Our detection rates on rape and sexual assault are, are going up. They still need to be higher, but they're sort of in the better half of the, of the country. Um, we're doing well in terms of reducing um, a whole range of different crime types. Our problem at the moment is, is robbery and, um, and, um, and theft from the person, um, sort of street robbery and theft from the person. Those are the two that are um, ticking up most concerningly. Um, I think they're still behind where they were pre, um, uh, in some ways, pre-lockdown, but they are, they are concerning. So we're doing a lot of operations on that, um, sort of patrols, hotspots, arrests, etc. but it's something we've got to make more progress on. Yeah, well, thank you for your honesty on that. Um, so in your first 100 days and since the murder of Sarah Everard, what improvements have you made on the safety of women and girls in London? So if, if we look at our, um, we're, we're going putting more of our um, police resources into the public protection environment, and we're trying to strengthen that area because the case load there is overstretched. Um, there have been a whole range of initiatives working with um, women across London to identify vulnerable locations. We've done proactive patrols. We've made um, very powerful arrests. There was a um, very impressive arrest by a couple of officers just a couple of weeks ago who um, identified a predatory male who was um, 
literally out there with equipment to um, to attack a woman with. Um, so we're making a lot of progress on those cases. Our detection rates, I mentioned earlier, have, have, have gone up. So we are doing a lot in that space, but there is so much more to do. Thank you. Um, when violent and prolific offenders, let's say, such as Jordan Masweeney, um, are released from prison, uh, are the Met made aware of this and what plans do they put in place to monitor them? So uh, it depends on the um, level of risk, but the most serious risk of offenders are uh, there's, there's, there's joint activity between police and probation, um, there are often joint boards in terms of joint risk assessment boards and coming up with plans in terms of what police will do and what they will do. That's how the system works at the highest end of risk, but there are um, there's, a, there's a great volume which um, the police will get told of routinely, I think, pretty much all prison releases, but many of them are low-risk individuals and there's um, perhaps some, some follow-up from probation service if someone's on licence, um, but many of those cases the police don't have an active role in. Uh, do the Met have any power to, say, ask the probation uh, service to maybe monitor the person in the way of, say, a an ankle monitor or something? Can so in the highest risk cases, the conditions that are put on somebody being released from prison is discussed between police and probation. Um, and so the more you get towards the most dangerous offenders in terms of violence against women and girls or um, ex-murderers, terrorists, etc., then the more there's a, a case conference approach and a lot of thinking about what are the best measures and controls you can put around somebody. Um, the more you get towards lower risk offences, then... Um, then there's less of that goes on for all, sort, all sorts of obvious reasons. Thank you. So following the murder of um, Zara Alina by Jordan McSweeney and the fact that it took six days for the probation service to ask the Met to arrest him, what conversations have you had to improve the speed at which probation communicates uh, with the Met? I think that's more a question for probation than it is for me. Yes. But surely um, the Met should be expressing their concerns about that and someone should be having a conversation with probation about the fact they need to sharpen their act. Would you not agree, Commissioner? I, I think it's for others to hold probation to account. I mean, we will do everything we can to work with them, but I, so it's not for me to hold them to account. Can I come in on that just to uh, say what, what, what MOPEC is doing? Um, because, uh, I mean, clearly this is a devastating murder. Um, and uh, we have been looking at the best way to, to, to learn the lessons from it. Uh, I mean, although there were failings by the probation service um, at the time of the perpetrator's release, there had actually been a long line of engagement with the state uh, on the part of the perpetrator, which kind of culminated in this terrible event. Um, so um, the Deputy Mayor, who chairs the uh, London Criminal Justice Board, is going to write to partners across the criminal justice system this week to ensure that um, we're using this tragic event to learn between agencies about what actually happened. Um, and also, uh, it is our intention to write to central government, both uh, a Home Office and uh, Ministry of Justice, to call for, a, for an independent multi-agency review to look at how all the agencies, not just probation and prisons involved in this case, might have, might have done things differently. So it's clearly absolutely vital that we do learn the lessons from this, this devastating event. Thank you. And... Um what do you think um, can be done to encourage women to come forward on crimes such as rape and sexual assault? Well, I mean, I think that links to what we were talking about uh, earlier in terms of driving up trust and confidence, because obviously these cases do huge damage to women's willingness to, to, to come forward to report cases. So, um, you know, tackling the culture in the Met, driving out misogyny, uh, creating a clearly anti-misogynist uh, organisation is, is absolutely key to that, as well as a, a, a number of measures that obviously the Mayor has been taking to, uh, to, to tackle women and, uh, violence against women and girls, which is a clear area of priority for both him and the Deputy Mayor. I don't think, I, uh, so I agree with what Diana says, but I don't think this is just about the police, I think it's about the whole criminal justice system That's and right. the support around it. Um, I mean, I think sort of it, it, it must be probably the most ghastly and intrusive sort of crimes that we're talking about here. And to expect a victim to have that hanging over them, the prospect of giving evidence for two, three, four years, as we're seeing with some of the cases at the moment, is 
is completely unconscionable and I think there's a, there's a we need a much more we, dramatic change in the way the criminal justice system works overall and the police have our role in that but I, 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 it can't be just about us right no, no I, I'm not s suggesting it is I think, no, no. I think every um, everybody needs to take responsibility for this and all parties have a part to play um, just quickly touching on sanction detection for rape I'd be interested to know um, what the Met's doing to improve that but also uh, do you know what sort of success rate is when it does actually go to court because currently we're only looking at sanction detections of around six percent I'd have to write you on the on the court issue so Project Sateria, which Mopac started, which is a, looking at a, a different approach to um, rape investigation, pulling best practice across the country, being much more offender-centric. That's been a big part of us improving our detection rates. So, say so we're in the top half of the country. I can't pull them out the back of my mind at the moment, but it's um, uh, detection rates across the country, across rape, and particularly fell about 2018. They went down dramatically. Um, for a range of reasons in terms of changing the law and practice, which is of real concern. And they're slowly building back up, but they've got a long way to go. But so I'm, I'm pleased that we're making progress, but um, we're not complacent about it. There's an awful lot to do. Two more questions, one really from Mopac. Um, a scheme in 2021 uh, was announced allowing uh, people uh, from des uh, domestic abuse victims to stay in their homes while the perpetrators found an alternative accommodation. How successful has this been and what more can be done to find safe places for women fleeing domestic abuse? Um, are you talking about the, uh, the, the, the new duty upon us to provide uh, secure accommodation for for domestic abuse victims, is that is that what what you're ref the scheme you're referring to? Well, I, I'm uh, really asking you about what you're doing to uh, enable victims of abuse to stay in their homes, and then you obviously have to find alternative uh, accommodation for the perpetrators. Uh, that's something that was announced in 2021, uh, and then also I'm also asking you about finding safe spaces for women fleeing domestic abuse. So. Whatever you know yes, well, we've, we've, we've made uh, considerable uh, investment in support services, um, uh, in, in, in including specialised response to, to, to support all victims to have equal access to justice and, uh, and, and services. Um, I mean, the Mayor's absolutely clear that women shouldn't be having to change their behaviour and, as I say, has uh, launched a new strategy that champions a, a public health approach to ending violence against women and girls, uh, which includes... Um, our uh, one million pounds on our education toolkit, which has been launched in schools, which is uh, directed at particularly at boys to help them recognise and tackle sexist and misogynistic behaviour, um, and uh, extending the pioneering GPS tagging pilot programme um, to, to tag knife crime and domestic abuse offenders who are released from prison, uh, which has which has recently been extended. And in terms of uh, refuges, I can I can write to you about uh, wh what we're doing there and what our investment levels are. But I know it's something that we prioritise. Yeah, I mean, if you could on both of those aspects, because it's two very different aspects. Is one trying to enable the victim to stay in their home, which wouldn't mean you have to provide alternative accommodation for the perpetrator. Uh, but it's also what we do to accommodate those who are actually fleeing domestic abuse, which again would mean housing that particular victim. So it's two very different yeah. aspects. Okay. Of that. Perhaps I can write to you so you can yes, see it more do. clearly. That would be perhaps. Fine. Thank you. Um, and finally, uh, the Commissioner, if I can ask you this question. What improvements have been made for whistleblowing in the Met against officers showing dangerous and toxic behaviours? Mm. So uh, uh, we spoke earlier about our external reporting line. We've done the same internally, and that's similarly producing sort of um, several cases, uh, um, several cases a week. So that's that's positive. I I think the most important thing here is whether officers believe leaders are up for confronting the issues. It concerns me when I see some commentators suggest that people don't report because they're in fear of their colleagues and canteen culture type things. I don't think that's the main issue. Um, I think the main issue is confidence in leaders to tackle it. Because if, if you were going to report something against a colleague, you would think, if I'm going to put my hand up and sort of take this, take, do this difficult thing, I need confidence the system will back me and follow through. So I think it's, it's more about leaders and that's the important thing. So I think 
what we're seeing is with our commitment, what, what sort of me and other leaders are saying, um, with the Louise Casey report, with our response to that, um, we are seeing increased confidence to report, and we're trying to make sure we harness that by doing a good job in terms of following through, for example, like those alleging sort of um, uh, sexual misconduct and criminal allegations, putting real specialists in that world. So that's the way we're doing it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're now going to move on to anti-corruption. Uh, some of these, I think, might have been answered, but uh, starting off with my colleague, Assemblymember Pigeon. Thank you very much. Um, so, Mark, you set out very clearly at the start your action review refresh, and that gave us a great context. But let me just tease out um, a few issues. One, you said you're going to come back to us with details of the staffing in that unit. Yep. And also, if you're not at um, you know full capacity there, when do you expect to be? So that would be really helpful for us. But can you explain to us kind of the workload of that command? How many current cases do they have? How many, you said it's about 1,000, I think, from this, I'm going to call it a database trawl that you described at the start. Um, and, and what is the caseload that that team are dealing with, please? So if you wanted a detailed layout of caseload, I'd have to come back in terms of that detail. Well, so the types of work, so you've got um, across the whole of professional standards, or do you just want the, 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 the anti-corruption abuse command? Um, I think the anti-corruption abuse yeah. command so particularly, your, because you're focusing on reaching exactly, out corrupt officers, exactly. which so, we all support. So within that, you've got an intelligence function. So any any sort of uh, initial allegations, how do you need to research those, particularly if you get a, a phone call to a hotline. So you're researching the, the, the background of officers and whether this looks like there might be some credibility in it. There are some investigative teams. Um, there are um, the, the key thing on this side is the proactive work, so proactively going after um, officers. So we've got some information that sort of Officer X may be, um, I, know, st I know, pick something simple, I know, stealing money from the property store. Um, how we're going to sort of how we're going to find that officer? How we're going to um, get evidence against mm. that officer? Um, so it might involve surveillance. It might involve other uh, other sort of uh, other research. Um, likewise, we have a, a unit there that looks at the, the officers we've got known concerns about and we're putting restrictions on and how we can manage them out of the organisation. So there's a range of proactive functions that we've strengthened. I mean, we, we grew it by 30% as we sort of, with existing resources, as we stood up this separate command. And um, we're, some of them are recruited, some of them are in post have been recruited, and we've got about 40% increase in the amount of proactive and covert investigations they're doing. So the biggest challenge is capacity? Um, so we've we've made a sort of a sort of a, a stab at actually this extra capacity will give us a, a good head start on what we need to do over the next few months as we get through this review work and the workload settles down we'll have to review that capacity and see whether it's right and whether we need more or not. And in terms of the hotlines you've talked about, you've got the external one, yeah, um, and and you've talked about effectively an internal one. Yeah. Since you've been imposed, how many calls? And you know your absolute publicity around I want to root these officers out encouraging people to come forward how many calls have both of those different hotlines so, received so each of the internal and external are producing sort of tens uh, tens per week each okay. low tens low tens each low tens per week so that is increasing their workload yeah. will you be reviewing the number of officers in this command yeah, exactly. if needed so you can and tackle you, this and, and, and at the moment there's quite a bit of resource pressure there that we're looking at because you've got both the increased new investigation workload coming in and also, you've got this backward-looking piece of work, mm. reviewing the 1,000 sort of 1,071 old cases, if you like, and doing this data wash vetting review. So if you overlay more new mm. cases with mm. reviewing old work, it creates quite a bit of pressure, even with the extra resources. So we're constantly looking at that. And also in there, you've got the existing caseload, because exactly, there must yeah. have been, as we know, because some of them are going through the <laughs> exactly. courts, the two or three a week we're going to see, yeah. must be hundreds of existing cases yeah. that are ongoing. Yeah, so will you be able to, if you can't give us it today, write to us with that detailed we'll that breakdown? Detail out. That would be great. Um, and that command is taking over cases that were already in the system, presumably. Yeah, so, so we've, we've broken out of what was the professional standards department. We've broken out the proactive and intelligence function to cover a separate, um, a separate command. Because we think it, if you want to tackle a problem, you have to go after it. You can't just mm. wait for mm. reports to come in. So creating that stronger proactive emphasis is what the extra command does. But you've still got the, the, the sort of core bulk of, mm. of what was 
what ESAM was DPS in terms of all the reactive investigations, some of which are internal, some of which are a member of the public complains an officer was um, rude to them or whatever else it might be. Okay, okay, that's, that's helpful. And how are you working with the IOPC on, on all of this? Um, the command, you know, have they got a close working relationship? Close How's working that? relationships, and, and we, um, the Deputy Commissioner and I are very keen. We take a more sort of um, forthright approach to referrals. So we're doing a lot more. There's, there's some mandatory referrals to the IFPC, but mm. we're very keen they have as much visibility as they can cope with in terms of our work, frankly. So we're doing more voluntary referrals to, mm. so to give them sight of what we're doing and give them the opportunity to pick up anything independently if they feel they need to. Lovely. And I, I finally, for me, you talked about leadership and the leaders have got to be up for confronting the issues. Um, there was an article in the Mail on Sunday um, from Lord Brian Paddock where he set out his experience, albeit 20 years ago, um, in the Met of s different systems sitting on panels, officers being disciplined, officers being dismissed, and then um, more senior officers reinstating them despite the red flags. Now that says to me that there could still be issues in leadership roles. So what are you doing around that? And secondly, will one of your, you or one of your senior team or even Louise Casey speak to Brian Paddock? Because there must be learning from his experience that could feed into the work you're doing. Yeah, one of us can definitely pick up the phone to, um, to Brian. So I think so, some of the leadership issues is about, yeah, so most of our leaders are good people. Uh, some of this is about confidence and skills, which is why I've spoken about leadership and training. Some of it's about policies that some of our policies perhaps dis leaders feel uncomfortable using them and so they find it difficult. So there's a, there's a lot of work to do to create a leadership that is skilled and confident at dealing with this. But it shouldn't all be seen as this is leaders who don't want to. It's about equipping them and giving, the, giving them the ability to do so. And, and just, just finally, a question that I have asked many, many times when I used to be on the MPA is there is an issue, I probably I would suggest more in the past, around Freemasons and declaring that and whether that has any influence. Are you looking at all at that to see if that has any impact or has had any impact in, in this whole process around trying to root out corrupt officers and people sometimes turning a blind eye? Um, it's not something that's come up at all in any of our intelligence and research. I think um, a long time ago, policing put in place a policy that you had to declare it. So, I, and I, I but they don't have to. It was never enforced. Is that right? I'll, I'll double check that. Um, but um, I, it's not something I've seen any evidence is a problem. I think we've got um, many other places to look rather than that. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you very briefly. The IOPC was brought up. Are they getting any quicker? Because for a very long time that you'd have officers not able to drive because they were being investigated for something relatively minor and they were off various sorts of duties. So they need to get quicker and we need to get quicker. So if you look at the Louise Casey report, I think our investigations have an average length of a year. Their investigations, I think, was three or four months longer than that. So, um, and, and given they take on particularly complex cases quite often, that's not that surprising that it's longer, but both of us need to be quicker because it's, uh, but if we've got something wrong, it's bad for the victim of that, that it takes so long. And if we've got something right, it's bad for the officer that they've got it hanging over that period of time. And so, yeah, for, for both reasons, this needs to be quicker. Absolutely, and they're of course on duty when we need them actually doing their exactly. work. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Assembly Member Ahmed. Thank you, Chair. Commissioner, you have touched on the issue of uh, the amount of time that it takes to look at misconduct cases, but I wonder if we can go just a bit deeper into that. What actions have you taken to reduce the time it takes to investigate misconduct cases? What impact are your actions having and what are the next steps? Uh, so the timelines are coming down slowly. The uh, the extra resources that we put in professional standards, some of that has gone into that. The, the, the big volume is in this reactive caseload and it has been too slow. It's been something that I think MOPAC has been raising for quite a long, quite a long time. Um, so we are seeing those numbers starting to come down. Um, we're going to have to keep an eye on our resources levels and, and as, as uh, 
the previous member was suggesting in terms of as you got more work coming in have we got the resources right to be able to get through the cases properly but we are seeing progress on that thank you it, it is something that londoners i think are very very concerned about because they don't understand why it takes so long so it is reassuring to know yeah. that that work is being done thank you thank you assembly member Maima. <coughs> Thank you, um, Chair. Um, my question is to Diana, and I wondered if you could briefly outline how MOPAC has strengthened its oversight of MET disciplinary processes in the last six months, in addition to the two points that you raised before about your work to date. Yes, certainly. Um, <clears throat> I mean, the first thing I'd like to acknowledge is that we do recognise that this is an area where we do need to uh, strengthen our, our response. Um, because of obviously the increased attention being given to, given to these issues, the increasing number of cases, the, the particular emphasis that the Met is now placing on it, and shortly we will have the outcomes of the KC review and of Dame Angelini's uh, reviews also. So uh, in practical terms, we, have, uh, we are recruiting two additional officers to the um, MOPAC oversight and professionalism team to kind of increase capacity there. Um, we also in the last few months, uh, or not, not, not in the last few months, but uh, over the past um, year or so, we've been regularly meeting with Barbara Gray, who is the uh, AC in uh, DPS in the Met, to discuss the learning from, from cases, uh, how that links to um, uh, HMIC report recommendations and wide, their wider transformation plans. We also meet monthly with the Met to uh, discuss high-profile cases and identify any emerging themes in those cases, such as, such as sexual assault or use of social media, for example. Um, we, our, our focus is really on the opportunities for the Met to intervene at an earlier stage uh, and to make sure that they're using uh, data as far as possible to identify appropriate risk factors uh, and, uh, in order to kind of help root out poor behavior and corruption. Um, and uh, as, as uh, Sir Mark has remarked, we've also been encouraging them to, the, the Met, to, to push the boundaries of the conduct and complaints legislation so that, we, so that investigations can be sped up and we can um, exit offices as quickly as possible. Uh, I mean, clearly, you know, as we've, we've, we've been discussing, there are going to be challenges here because the action that the, the proactive way that, that Sir Mark is responding to this, this issue is obviously generating more cases, uh, you know, 30 to 40 a week coming through the helpline. That's a positive that, that you know, those are being surfaced. Uh, and as he said, some of those actually relate, a third of those, I think, relate to other forces. Uh, but that's going to kind of increase the throughput. So it's absolutely key that we are being... Uh, as efficient and responsive as we can, and that we've got um, uh, effective, uh, you know, resources in place. I'm also conscious that um, you have written to us uh, on the, your police conducts uh, and complaints report, uh, and that we um, owe you uh, a response on that, and that will be forthcoming very shortly. Uh, that included. Um, a recommendation around uh, uplift uh, in IOPC funding. Uh, so we have um, we have written uh, we've included that uh, in a letter that uh, was sent to Home Office Minister last week following the police settlement as something that we would support. So Mark, I don't know if you had any thoughts on that. If um, you how you have found that um, oversight and how it's changed in response to your approach um, since you've become commissioner. And um, then to both of you, if you feel like there are the resources in the Met to, um, to uphold those high professional standards that we aspire to. So I think in terms of, um, a, sort of a, a, my, a new leadership team on my side, settling down and working with um, MOPAC, it's been, uh, it's, it's absolutely fine and we're finding the right way to, to sort of to work together because there's things we need, there's things we need support on um, in terms of sort of, I know, policy and politics and money and various issues that we're constantly discussing look at and so there's a it's that uh, balance isn't it between working in partnership but also um mopac is there to scrutinize us as well and so getting the mix of those things right is 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 never simple but i'm very satisfied with how it's going just to add that i'm also satisfied with how, how it's going um and i think it's fair to say that we have observed Markedly less defensiveness, more open sea, um, open sea, more transparency and, and openness uh, with, with, with the new uh, senior leadership team. 
and uh, we're working in collaboration with them whilst also, of course, uh, maintaining appropriate oversight. Okay, thank you. So we're now moving to His Majesty's Inspectorate, uh, putting us as, or putting the Met, I should say, into engage. My colleague, Assembly Member Garrett, is going to lead the questioning. Morning. Yes, yeah, so we can start with you, uh, Sir Mark. Um, so the result of being in the engage process, um, what is the Met uh, doing differently and what tangible results might we see already as a result of that process? Um, thank you. So the, the strategy that we've published, the draft strategy, is heavily influenced by the engage, um, by the engage process. Um, the publicised letter that started the engage process last summer, um, I think, had 13 or 14 bullet points in it, listing an area, uh, sort of A to M or N, listing a range of concerns. Um, and we're working through those. Some of those are symptoms of some deep-lying issues that we're, we're looking, to, looking to tackle. Um, exit from Engage will come, the, their criteria are um, you are making progress and you have a credible plan to go forward. Those are the, those are the two things and that's a, a reasonable generic statement. So some of the things that we've done so far sort of like the, the, that have referenced in it, the Daniel Morgan, um, recommendations. Um, uh, we're on track to deliver uh, most of those at the moment, so the, the about 80, 80 odd percent of those. Um, the others, the others, and some a common theme, a big area is 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 around victim care and particularly around contact centre and call handling, and that's a big theme in our in our plan. And we're looking to put more, we're putting more resources into there, and we're trying to sort of change the way we. We work there. There's quite a lot of fundamental change re required in that in, uh, required in that environment. Um, in terms of areas like um, uh, the project tenacity we mentioned earlier was about getting on top of some of our violent offender areas. Another area they highlighted was um, we had a massive backlog in terms of um, uh, online sexual abuse, child image and sexual abuse referrals, and we've taken that backlog down from thousands to very few, so we've sort of caught up with that. So there's, there's several areas which have been long-standing issues which we've got, um, got progress on. Of course, there's more to do. And so I think, for me, the balance, some of the symptoms you can work through quite quickly, some of the underlying issues, say like a you know, control room not working as well as it needs to in terms of call handling, that's a big system volume issue which takes a bit longer to get through. But that, that's a sort of a spread across the sort of things we're doing. Okay. Um, the improvement plan that HMI asked you to produce as part of that process, I think you, you referred to it just now, is that something that you, is that public? Have you shared that with the committee? Um, we've done update reports with um, HMIC. I mean, our, our improvement plan is really, we're not creating different documents. We have a strategy. That's what we've published. That's what, that, uh, that's how we're approaching it. And that's, that contains all the things we need to do. I'm really, I, I think one of the things that's not helped the Met in the past is having too many strategies with too many pages in, sort of, and actually trying to try, trying to be really focused. These are the most important things that we need to do to do for London what they expect. That's critical, and that's what that turnaround plan is is trying to do. So we're going to keep coming back to one document as much as we can do, rather than having so many different strategies that you can't see the wood for the trees. But that's okay. the trees you're chopping down to create to write the strategies on. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we we, we do have email these days. So, I mean, I take that as a no, but I take the argument for your no that if we just look at your overall strategy, yeah. are you saying that if we look at that, that should encompass all exactly. of the various strands of work you're exactly. doing, including yeah. this improvement plan and everything yes, else? Yes, exactly. Well. So we look at that, study that yeah. closely. That should yeah. tell us all we need to know. Exactly. Okay. In terms of the um, the uh, the engage meetings that happen sort of regularly as part of that process, d who is attending those meetings? Who's who's sort of in the room? So uh, those are chaired by so Andy Cook, who's the chief uh, chief HMI. Um, he chairs them. The London HMI, Matt Parr's in the room, um, and then there's um, uh, sort of on their side of the table, so to speak. There's a, a few other people supporting them, and then. On our side of the table, so to speak, is uh, is myself and and the mayor and the deputy mayor, again um, uh, supported by one or two other people from sort of from my team and and, and Diana. And did did you see you were, you were there in the room? I assume yeah, myself from, and from the mayor. From I said yes, exactly. Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. And um, and what are the, what's the what are the measures? I think you perhaps 
suggested this before. So the measures of progress that the HMI are looking for, it's are you making progress on the things that they've identified and is there a, a credible, credible plan, plan to continue so, so, to so, the, so what they're trying to say is that the test to come out of Engage shouldn't be perfection on the basis that no big organisation is ever going to be perfect, but sort of the test should be you, you're, in a, you're, you're in Engage because you've got a collection of issues that are either collectively or individually so acute that you need special attention. So are you making, are you making progress on those issues and is the trajectory and the plan convincing about where, where you're heading to? That's, that's what they want to look for. Okay, and sort of thinking, you know, the layers further down within the Met, the sort of, uh, the, the, you know, not necessarily the top team who are working with you closely on it, but um, the sort of senior leaders and, and, and the team further down in the Met, um, what's the response at that level to the engage process? Um, I, or, or I suppose what I mean is, what, what does it mean for them, or what do they think it means for them? So, I think it's. I don't think most of them should be troubled by it. And, but by what I mean is, there are. It's for senior leaders to make sense of the environment that we're operating in. There's the engage issue. There's Morgan recommendations. There's Casey recommendations, etc. It's not for. I know a superintendent who's in charge of volume crime investigation on a on a BCU shouldn't be worrying about all that. It's up to us to create a strategy that captures all those things and makes clear for him or her their role in this is these are the priorities for them in terms of that context. So, so they will see it filtering through. An example of this would be um, the um, call handling environment. If we look at victim care, if we look at all the reports, we did a big analysis of I think a thousand recommendations, I think at least we're in it from HMIC and other bodies over the last few years. And what I found was these were being dealt with us on separate checklists, um, which is a very messy bureaucratic way of doing it. You bring them all together and arrange them, you discover that I think it was like 22 or 23% of them were around victim care, scattered across multiple reviews. If you bring that together, then you work out what are the big chunks of activity you need to do to improve that, one part of which is the, sort of the initial contact, if you like, from the control room. And so you have a systematic approach to improving the control room rather than doing, tick, trying to tick off individual recommendations from this report here and this report there and that report there, if that, if that makes sense. So, that, so what the leaders uh, are seeing is a much clearer, simpler strategy as this approach lands rather than having multiple people holding to account on checklists, which doesn't get you anywhere. No, that makes a lot of sense. I think one of the life experiences of, of let's call them middle management in any organisation is you have multiple different processes ongoing further up in the organisation which each spit out different sets of priorities. Exactly. Several of which are in conflict and no one tells you how you're meant to resolve it. Exactly. So, you're, you, so the resolution is happening at the senior level where, as you say, there's this one strategy, everything feeds into that strategy. The senior leaders are creating that strategy and further down the organisation that yeah. should mean a consistent set of priorities and messages. Yes, and that's why we're doing an executive redesign in terms of restructuring our senior leadership and um, accountability structures and performance frameworks. All of that is, it's all sort of, for a public viewer, this is all really boring and interesting stuff, I know, but it's the foundations of how you run a big organisation successfully. Yeah, I mean, organisations are big teams of people that get complicated things done that one person can't do by themselves. Exactly. And so how that gets done is actually, anyway for me quite interesting um, <laughs> which I suppose is how I end up sitting here um, it's a, it's turning to MOPAC if I may uh, Diana so what are you satisfied from MOPAC's point of view about the, the, the progress that the Met are making and the way that they're engaging with that engaged process yes absolutely um, and uh, as Mark has mentioned <coughs> the mayor has been to the PPOG which is the curious uh, acronym for the HMIC meeting that, uh, that runs uh, the engage process uh, on a couple of occasions uh, to, to, to support the mayor. Um, and indeed, you know, we welcome the, 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 the scrutiny that, that, that's being provided. Um, and, and we're keen to use the engage process uh, and to, to kind of drive the fundamental changes that, 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 we, that, that we need. So, um, yes, the, the, the mayor is, is, is strongly in support of uh, the Met's plan and uh, is participating actively in the, in the process. I am, Kenny is the expert on engage, so I am going to ask him whether he wants to add anything. No, I mean, well, I would say there's much to add. We're, I think, safe to say we're very pleased with how 
it's being done. We're very <coughs> pleased with the level of engagement that the Commissioner and his team gave us in terms of the opportunity for the Mayor, Deputy Mayor and MOPAC to feed into the turnaround plan. It did feel like a, a genuine uh, sort of partnership approach there, which is very positive, and we are very supportive of everything Sir Mark has said in terms of having one plan which brings everything together rather than things going off in multiple directions. So, not much to add. So, what's the task list for MOPAC in terms of supporting the Met to get where they need to get to? Yes, so, I th I th oh, sorry. Diana, can we ask you to answer your to the CEO? That, well, well, our task list is to uh, look at the various uh, aspects of the turnaround plan. There are there are nine priorities uh, within that, um, and to scrutinise their progression um, across those those identified areas, including through our regular uh, oversight board meetings, we, 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 which we have uh, every couple of months. One of the questions that I think has come up here before, I think with the Deputy Mayor at a pre previous meeting, was about how it, to, to what extent it reflects on, on MOPAC that obviously the Met got to this position. Um, and I was a bit concerned, there was a comment by Sir Tom Windsor that um, the decision to move the Met into the engaged process was partly about losing confidence in the Met and partly about losing confidence in MOPAC's ability to, to turn around the Met. And so, you know, his view was that it's not just because the NPS was failing, it was also because MOPAC was failing. So what sort of internal reflections is, is MOPAC having on, on that, either on that observation or on, you know, in the, the problems that that points to? Yeah, I mean, I think we talked about this last time when uh, MOPAC board came before um, the, 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 the committee and we acknowledged that uh, the HMIC report that has resulted in the engaged process identified some issues that um, MOPAC had already uh, identified itself. Um, and we continue to use our oversight function to uh, ensure that, that, that those issues are being tackled. But of course, we keep that under review uh, constantly. And uh, you know, we, as I say, we have taken steps to strengthen our oversight in areas where we think that has been, uh, you know, has perhaps been deficient with misconduct uh, being being and professional standards deficient is perhaps putting it a bit strongly. But where it could be strengthened with uh, our oversight of misconduct and professional standards being one of those. Of course, I mean, there is always learning to take. There are so many different agencies in this space who are commenting on what the police are doing uh, all of the time. So there is always more that, that, that MOPAC should be doing and that, that, that we need to take account of. OK. It's just that I remember getting slightly cross with the Deputy Mayor at the time when she gave a very similar answer. And you, you know, the language of the answer you've just given me was about continue to and keep under review. That's not the language of an organization that's having a sort of deep and meaningful conversation with itself about how its inadequacies led to the problem. You know, it's, 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 it's very different from the language that we now hear from the Met about how there are problems, we acknowledge the problem, not we, Met acknowledge the problems and this is what we're doing about it. The language of continue to and keep under review and of course, you know, any organization dot, 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 that does sound a bit like, I mean, I'm, tr I'm trying to find a diplomatic alternative for complacent, but I've, I've struggled. So I'm just going to say I, I, it I, does I, come I, across a bit yeah. like that. I would, I would challenge complacency. Sorry. Did you want to well, let me, let me, no. let me phrase the question differently. So what are the real actions that have taken? What are the changes that have happened in MOPAC as a result of this, where you said, we've got these problems, this is what we're doing about it differently? Um, go on. No, Di Diana, you're, Diana, you're the chief executive. Yeah. Yes, well, so I, well we, we have made various uh, structural changes, um, as I say, increasing resource in specific areas. Um, so there are, there are, there are things that, that we have done, and we continue to keep MOPAC under review and uh, in, ensure that we are doing the, 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 best, the best job that we can. I would, uh, you know, I, I would certainly challenge complacency. Did you want to I mean, come in? To, to be blunt, the best way you could challenge my charge of complacency would be to list things rather than Well, just let me send you a list of things. In fact, I think that may be one of the uh, outstanding areas on the, on the, on the, 
Yeah, in, uh, in, in your follow-up from, uh, from the previous session. Uh, okay, I, I set, uh, I'm conscious of time and, but, uh, and also that, you, you know, I've asked you the question a couple of times and you haven't listed anything. Can I, I think can if I, I were chief, let me just say, I think if I were chief executive of an organisation that had a deeply <laughs> meaningful conversation with itself about the problems it has and how it's got into difficulty, <laughs> and somebody asked me, what are the things that you're doing in this organisation that you're leading? I feel like I'd have at least one or two on the top of my head, otherwise I would wonder, you know, what am I doing? So can I just come in if that's okay? So first of all... No, no, no I'm sorry. The questions are directed okay, to Diana. You. Okay. As so I, I think said, I will, I, will, I, will, I will send you a list. Okay. Uh, if I can note my disappointment, but I think that's the end of my Yes, questions. okay. Yeah. Before just say, we I'm go on to... I'm in charge of oversight, no. so... Yeah, it is please. Pertinent we, we, we've got the chief executive here. T tell me, Diana, these meetings with the HMI, do you attend all of them? No, they're quite, um, they're quite limited in terms of numbers. So uh, when, the, you know, they will only usually allow us to admit three, two, two, two or three people. So I but you're the yet. chief, with respect, you've got some Mark Rowley there. You, you can't get more senior than that. And the mayor, who I have to admit, you can't get more senior than that. Um, you're the chief executive officer. We hardly ever see you. I would have thought that was such a high level meeting and so important to get right. MOPAC should be doing everything they can to assist the Met, uh, to, to, if they see anything that's wrong, to assist the Met. We must all assist the Met for our own sakes. So you don't go to any, you send your staff to these meetings as opposed to seeing what's happening yourself is that is that correct well uh, i think i talked to you when i was last here about my distributive leadership model which means that i am here to lead mopac not to be mopac you know and there are other people that that that, that can undertake responsibilities i don't have to do everything personally it may be uh, it, it may be uh, sensible for me to go to a future ppog meeting and i i will decide that as and when, but clearly, you know, I, I task and I, I think about, I, I think about capacity and what other um, responsibilities I may have okay. on a particular day, and whether it, you know, it would actually okay. add much weight for me to attend as well as Sophie, okay. the mayor, Mark, and and Kenny. Yeah, it's very important, and I will just say thank goodness Sir Mark is leading from the front. Uh, now, if we can move over, please, to uh, Assembly Member Sahota to finish this section. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, C Commissioner, when do you hope to come out of the engaged process? Um, that's oh, I nearly fell for it then. That's, um, that's not in my gift. Uh, I, we're trying to work up the exact criteria under those headlines I gave earlier with um, HMIC, and that might give me a view. I mean, I'd like to get out next month. That's not going to happen. Um, that, that said slightly glibly, as soon as, it, as soon as is possible. We have a lot to do. Um, I'm not in any um, doubt on that, and I, I think if I obsess about a process, that's slightly dangerous for London. I should be more focused on what we're doing for London, for a whole range of reasons, including the fact that HMIC have made some very legitimate criticisms, and we need to tackle them. That you have the capacity and the capabilities to deliver the changes that the um, HMIRCFRS are, are looking for? I think um, sort of a headline, yes, but there's, there's a lot of building to do um, sort of in organisational terms. The sort of, you look at that, you look at the sort of turnaround plan and look at the themes underneath it and the work to be done, that is a lot of organisational leadership and change and there's technology in there, there's training, there's a, a lot of work to do, Cor sort of pulling together, coordinating, delivering an improvement programme of that scale is not straightforward and the way, the, the sort of the Met as I find it doesn't have the, um, hasn't built the capacity and capability to do that and that's not surprising because it's a new strategy so getting that around, so building a new leadership team getting the right support from inside and from outside in terms of some of the different programs, all of that change management sort of work, um, that's going to take some time to build, but that's what we're doing. It's not, it, there's not a resistance to us doing it in terms of our budget propositions. It's in there, and, and, and um, Mopac and the Mayor have been um, supportive, um, but it's not going to, you can't switch that capability overnight. Um, and, and, and one other thing is, uh, um, that the peer report highlighted that the, that the call time response, or the MPL was failing on the national targets. Um, this was a short-term priority for improvement, 
Um, where are we with improving those times? Um, we have been improving. I can't pull the number off, off the top of my head. I mean, and if you look, also, if you look at um, our, that then feeds into our response time, so our I grade our immediate response to, to 999 calls where there's immediate life at risk or an offender at the scene, um, and our response then to more standard incidents, which I think is within an hour. Both of those, they're still below where we want them to be, but their percentages are now starting to slowly creep up, which is positive. And, and, and Dan, are you happy with the progress the police are making on those uh, call times? Uh, yes, we are happy with, with the progress. Oh, sorry. Um, yes. Great. Okay, thank, thank, you. thank you. Well, well done, colleagues. We've come in exactly on time because uh, the Chief Executive, Diana <laughs> Lutchford, has to leave at 12. You've not finished there, Sir Mark, I'm afraid. Um, so thank you very much. To